Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebraic topology. Well, today I would like to ramble a little bit why the fundamental group is not the end of algebraic topology. So why algebraic topology doesn't stop with the fundamental group. And I do it, well, hiding, of course, using a smoke screen. I will explain one of my favorite lists, uh, namely a kind of a list of examples of fundamental groups. That's the whole topic. Um, but kind of the takeaway message will be that first of all, fundamental groups are very nice. We all know that fundamental groups are easy to explain. Um, they're also reasonably easy to compute. I will show you some computations. Well, I will kind of hint how to do those computations. Uh, then list my favorite examples or the kind of the easiest examples with reasonably nice fundamental groups. And the whole thing will have a flaw, a slight flaw. Um, for higher dimensional space, it's not quite the right language. So fundamental groups are really, really powerful to, to detect kind of structure you see in a one, on a one skeleton. So one dimensional substrings on one dimensional spaces, um, two dimensional spaces, so kind of on, on this level, uh, one skeleton, two skeleton, something like that. Uh, but the further you go away, that kind of less powerful it gets. Um, we'll see. Actually, on my already on my first slide. But anyway, in the end, I will show you a list, uh, a list of fundamental groups, which I usually like to remember because, well, th that's usually the fundamental groups you see in practice. So that's what the video is all about. Um, so let's get started. It's a fundamental group of the soccer ball. Soccer ball is, of course, S2. It's hollow. So that's why it's S2. Uh, soccer ball is hollow. So, um, so what is the fundamental group of this object? Well, the fundamental group of this object is actually trivial and that's not so hard to see. So here's my illustration that I of course stole, uh, link to everything is as usual in the description uh, that I of course stole. And it's pretty easy. You can think of, well, you have a belt. So roughly speaking, I'm a sphere, which is not quite true. There are some holes, but anyway, so roughly speaking, I'm a sphere and I could take my belt, right? So I could take my belt and I could pull it over my head. And that's exactly what this picture illustrates. Um, left hand wavy, so you can think of your, your sphere as two, you poke a hole into it and you bend it open and you see a plane, right? I poke a hole into, into here somewhere. Maybe I shouldn't use green. I poke a hole into here somewhere. And what I get is uh, a plane. And on the plane, I can easily kind of contract all circles to a point. We're just, we're just contracting them. And uh, this is just a fancy illustration of exactly that without poking the hole. And yeah, that actually already shows that fundamental group is trivial because you can contract all circles, either as I said, by poking a hole or by taking my belt and pulling it over my hat. That's the illustration there. Slight catch. Uh, so you might ask, why doesn't this trick actually doesn't work for S1? Well, slight catch, you need to know that you can push away curves from a certain point. For example, you can push away curves for the north, from the North Pole because that's where I want to poke my hole into, right? I want to poke my hole somewhere, let's say it's the North Pole and it would be bad if my curve passes exactly that pole. If you think about the circle, just the plain circle as one, right? You just can't do that. If I take out, well, <laughs> any reasonable uh, pass in this space, will pass the North, North Pole without me ever being able to push it away. But as soon as I uh, go to S2 or bigger, actually this works. And the same method shows that um, the pi one of Sn is trivial, as long as you're not in the case of S1. And this is kind of what I said before, like S1 has a really nice answer. It's the integers, it's kind of the example of a group, right? Um, and for S2 and bigger, there's actually nothing going on anymore. You really would like to have, I mean, S, the SNs might want to have a nice fundamental group, but they don't. They just, it's just, they just don't have any interesting, well, zero, one or two dimensional uh, cell structure. That's kind of the point here. As soon as you go very far away from, from those low dimensional, well, uh, cells, not much happens. And here, actually not much happens. So, if you know the fundamental group and well, it's so trivial on spheres and it doesn't get much better for higher dimensional spaces. 
it's not as bad as Volta Sphere, but it doesn't get much better. And you might want to come up with a different notion, with a higher dimensional notion. And we see that later, not in this video, of course, time flies, but um, later you would see higher fundamental groups, which people call homotopy groups. And homotopy groups of spheres are already very interesting. Just of spheres, they're already interesting. Anyway, so um, this was my ramble, oh, part of my ramble. I will, rem I will continue waffling, don't worry. Um, but the point here is um, for, for spheres, the fundamental group is trivial, unless you're too small in dimension, unless you end as one case. And that's certainly something, if you want to make a list of fundamental groups, that should appear, right? That should definitely appear. And the calculation was poke a hole. And that was basically it. Um, I want to poke another hole, but now in the torus or everything that kind of comes from, from some kind of fundamental polygon. So the torus illustrated here, uh, the donut shape. It's not a donut. Um, the donut hopefully has some interior. The torus is again hollow. Um, but anyway, so I just still call it a donut shape. And yeah, we all know how a torus looks like. And the point is, it has a nice fundamental polygon associated to it, which is just a square with the sides identified as illustrated. So A glues to A, B glues to B. You can, as I built this uh, at home, just take a square, hint, hint, as usual. Um, it's usually much better to take a long rectangle instead of really a square. But anyway, just for, uh, for the mental yoga, it doesn't really matter. So you take a square, you identify two edges, you get an annulus, a cylinder type shape, and then you identify the, the two ends of the annulus and you get a torus, uh, this donut-like shape. Again, not a donut, a donut-like shape, whatever. And we want to know the fundamental group of, of this beast. Well, why not? Because kind of the torus is the old star in topology anyway, so we should know it's a fundamental group. Turns out that it is not so bad, it's just z squared, but um, the real the real formulation, we'll see later why, uh, or actually I can tell you immediately why, because the this the real formulation generalizes to kind of any type of surface, is you have two generators, A, B, and they satisfy the relation A, B, A inverse, B inverse equals one. So it's trivial. And this is just, so for, if you have C group theory, this is just a commutator of A and B, which you, people usually write with square brackets. And if commutators of two elements are zero, then they, this means they commute. And if they commute, so you have two generators um, and they don't satisfy any other relation, it's Z squared. Good, so um, that's a nice result. So how can we actually see that? Well, you just look at the fundamental polygon, funny trick. Look at the fundamental polygon, fix your favorite vertex, and read along, and the reading direction doesn't matter. So let's say we read around clockwise, and you just go the, along the edges. You go A, you write A. You go uh, B, right? It has an orientation, you write B. You go A inverse, look at the orientation, you go A inverse, so you write A inverse. And then you go B inverse, and you write B inverse. You go B in the opposite direction, so you write B inverse. And that's the relation you, you kill. So um, the edges basically correspond to your generators up to the identification. And the relation is just pick a point, read it all, and well, write the symbols. Why does this work? So this is really easy to remember, right? And I'll show you later that this actually generalizes to any surface, um, or to, to, let's say at least to any orientable surface. Um, but the, the point is here, you can easily use cipher and put company by poking a hole. So basically you want to poke a hole in the square. So you have a U in the middle, you poke your hole and you have a V outside and the intersection is this red circle. So V is the gray part outside, basically the whole bunch. Um, and that's exactly what I did for the sphere before uh, or basically the analog of what I did for the sphere before. And here you have the intersection, of course. So for Zephyr and Pacamp, you always need a small color, the intersection. I was kind of ignoring that by my poking argument before, but it's, it's really just a poking argument. And then you just need to collect, I mean, uh, the green one, the U, which I really should do in green. So let me get it to green. Um, this was bad, let me give it another try. Green, very good. So the green one, uh, the U, 
that's a disk. A disk, well, it's contractible. In a disk, you can't draw any interesting loops. So doesn't matter, ignore it. You uh, intersecting the three. Oh, we have seen that. Oh, that looks like a sphere or a little bit of a thicket sphere, if you want. Yeah, so that has fundamental group Z. Um, and that's the one we blew along. Um, and the outside one is generated by A and B. I mean, it's this square with a, with a hole in the middle, right? So it's really generated by A and B. And then you use Seifert van Kampen, glue everything together, and you get this presentation here. Um, very easy to remember. If you look at the polygon, as I said again, just pick your favorite point, read along the edges, uh, that's your presentation. And yes, this generalizes, we'll see that later, but here is my second example of a fundamental group, the torus. Um, the third example are topological groups. I like them very much. I'm not assuming that you've seen them before, but one of them is certainly very familiar and I will show you other very familiar examples later. But one of them that is familiar, which I will run in a second using Mathematica code linked in the description, is the group of rotations of two space, uh, or let's say of um, orientation preserving rotations of two space, SO2. I will run this picture in a second, but it's really just rotations of two space. That's a group, why? Well, you'll see it in a second. It's just really adding angles, okay? And that's also topological space. You can actually, identify it in this case, because you are just adding angles with S1. But I want to keep this picture of SO2 because I want to think of, well, what is an example of a topological group? Everyone knows, or most people usually would see very early on without knowing that it is a topological group, let's say a general linear matrices. So this is a group, you can multiply matrices and it has some real numbers built in or complex numbers, depending a bit whether I want to do it or real numbers or the complex numbers. So there is some certain type of metric and topology going on. So this is a topological group. And in some sense, uh, well, not quite, but in some sense, um, all topological groups I want to think about are matrix groups. And it turns out this is extremely nice result that, um, well, in this case, it's S S1. So we know what the fundamental group actually is. It's Z, the integers. Um, but in general, fundamental groups of topological groups are commutative. And the reason, the way to see this, a link is in the description, is to use an Ekman-Hilton type argument by observing that there is actually secretly a second structure, a second group structure given by uh, using the group, uh, so second group structure on the fundamental group using the group multiplication of your given group itself. So in, in this case, matrix multiplication. Um, a little bit confusing, matrix multiplication is not uh, commutative, you might argue now. You're absolutely right, matrix multiplication, if you would do it, let's say for GLN, is not commutative, but this is only up to homotopy. And up to homotopy, you can actually pull it using an Ackman Hilton argument. Anyway, don't worry too much. Um, the point is for any topological group, you get this extremely amazing statement that the fundamental group is commutative, uh, which is quite a, quite a strange if you have. Uh, well, for, for, for in this video, I have only shown you so far commutative uh, uh, fundamental groups, but most fundamental groups are actually not commutative. Anyway, for a topological group, they're always commutative. Uh, I'll show you some examples in a second. And this is a list I would like to write down, okay? Um, my favorite list. For spheres, well, it's basically always trivial. Okay, for the torus, uh, the real projective plane or the Klein bottle, you can play the square trick. I leave that to you. You just write down the fundamental groups of those guys. Here's an example. So, um, uh, up. so here you fix a point, you name your edges A, A, B, B in, B. So, and then you read A, B, A, B inverse. A, B, A, B inverse. And the fundamental group in this case would be, well, generated by A and B, same trick as before, Seifert van Kampen, and this is a relation, and turns out that this is a Klein bottle. And you can do the projective plane very similarly, and you can do the torus, I already showed you how the torus works. So what, what is to remember that the Klein bottle has a slightly weirdish, well, slightly weirdish fundamental group, certainly not commutative. Uh, the torus has Z2, uh, sorry, Z squared, and the projective plane has Z2, and you could prove that using the same methods. 
threat. You could prove this one here using the poking method. I explained that before. You could prove uh, the second one using the poking method, just a little bit more sophisticated. You could prove the third point using the poking method. Um, I will show you how that works in a second. It's not, it, you can write it down for, for any orientable surface of genus G, even if you add in boundary points. Don't worry what that means right now. We'll see it on the next slide. So, and, and it's not so bad. You can write down a closed formula, which is really not so bad. And my third, uh, fourth point is, um, again, I'm coming back to my waffle here. Um, it, so the fundamental groups of the classical groups are actually pretty boring, also topological groups. Um, and I would like to consider the, the last five over C. Um, and of course, R and Q are just R and Q. So R is, for example, in a good example of a topological group. You have an addition on R, and the addition behaves well with respect to its topological structure. Same for Q. And both have trivial fundamental group for very, very different reasons. So in R, so here's my R. Uh, I could, I mean, what, what is a loop in R? I mean, a loop in R is going back, going forth and going back. That would be, for example, a loop. And of course, you could contract that to a point. Q, if I would like to draw Q, it actually would draw the same space. But secretly, it's very discrete. It has a lot of points. And each point is its own pass connect component. So the fundamental group is also trivial, uh, although um, Q looks very strange in some sense. It, it, it's, it's not continuous in some sense. It's still the fundamental group is trivial. And for all those higher groups, I made a list here. Um, Z mod two, but as you can see, they're not all really exciting groups. I mean, for the client bottle, you get kind of an exciting group. Um, for genus G, G surfaces, you get kind of funny groups. I will explain that in a second, as I said, but here for those higher dimensional spaces, so GLN, SLN, and so on, there's certainly higher dimensional spaces. Um, the fundamental groups don't look all that exciting. And kind of that's the reason why you need a better notion in the end, you need homotopy groups. Anyway, so fundamental groups are really not good to detect higher dimensional structures, or in some sense, they are not good. Uh, in the last point, I um, have a, certainly a one-dimensional structure, a graph. So whatever it is, here's a graph, a very boring one, a triangle graph, so just a collection of vertices and edges. And the fundamental group is a free product of these. And the z's that you will see here is you, you, you take a spanning tree, and you count edges not contained in the spanning tree because every edge you add corresponds to a, a, a closed cycle in the, in the graph, basically. I have explained that in another video. I don't want to go too much into details, but uh, the point is it's again, very easy to remember. For a graph, its fundamental group is just basically a free product, a lot of generators corresponding to edges uh, not contained in the spanning tree. So let me go to the last one. So this one here, but let me before uh, show you the promised animation of SO2. I almost forgot this animation that Mathematica code linked in the description. And it's really just a rotation matrix, right? You could think of a vector and how does an element of your group act on this? Well, exactly in this fashion by rotating. And then kind of the only thing that matters as you can see here is the angle so uh, without loss of information, you can actually identify SO2 with um, the circle. The higher SOs are in some sense more interesting. SO3 is one of the fundamental players in, in a lot of parts of mathematics, for example. Anyway, what you have seen in this picture is this continuous rotation and that behaves nicely with respect to, to, to the uh, topology. And so it's a topological group very similar to addition in R behaves nicely with respect to the natural topology on R and same for all the other guys. Um, and all, they have uh, all of them have a commutative fundamental group. So let's go to the oriented, uh, orientable surfaces. Orientable surfaces, exactly the same picture as before, as long as you don't take boundary components and boundary components, I will go to them in a second, is for example, if I have my oriented surface with two holes, the double torus, uh, that I could just puncture it a few times. I stick my finger into it, puncture it three times, so B equals three in this case, uh, G equals two. Um, so this would be a surface of genus two with three boundary points. Just stick your finger in, that's the boundary points, 
and the holes of the donut, if you want, that's the genus. Um, a more down to earth description, at least of the fully former one, would be to take the fundamental polygon, which is now uh, for a torus, it was a square. For a twofold torus or a two times torus, double torus, it's uh, an eight gun. So it's uh, eight. And uh, so square is four, and next is eight, and next one would be 12. So next would be a 12 gun. And you know how that works. Um, well, you label your edges A, B, C, D in this case, because it's an eight gun, and you glue along the orientation. And the way to compute the fundamental group is the same as before. You choose your favorite point. You choose your favorite reading direction, in this case, opposite of what we have seen before, and you read along. A, B, A inverse, B inverse, look at the orientations. Um, C, D, C inverse, D inverse, and you write it down, and that's your group. And before I just phrase this guy here and this guy here as a commutator, which is just this funny bracket. It's, it's exactly the same uh, expression, just written in a more compact way. Anyway, so this is not really, it's really easy. It's really the same argument as again, the Zypher van Kampen poking argument, and you just read along either cl cl clockwise or counterclockwise, it doesn't really matter. And you get the fundamental group of, um, of higher genuses. If you want to encode the, uh, the boundaries, these are punctures, you read them by little punctures, one, two, three of them, uh, well, actually B of them in this illustration. And you, we already know how that works, right? You have a circle around them, a, a loop around them, and each one of them spends a free group. So actually you get the free group here. It's not so hard in the number of boundary components. And you're almost done. So the only thing you need to do is to paste base basically both together. So, um, so this is a disk with B boundary, with, with B punctures. And you just take this disk, just one puncture more, and the corresponding M. And you, this M now has one puncture. You can think of it like this, and you can use the disk inside with, with B punctures. And this operation, again, you can use some Zyphert Fat Kappen argument, and you can compute the fundamental group that I showed you here. And this is the result. Um, Anyway, I'm already starting waffling. Actually, this whole talk was just a huge waffle. Um, so uh, my complaint a little bit about the fundamental group is, was, will be, whatever, is that it's not really good or not really as powerful as you think it would be for higher dimensional spaces. So in this talk, I just listed a few uh, examples of fundamental groups, and all of them were kind of, sort of the same flavor because you really need some kind of other notion for, for higher dimensional groups. Um, anyway, um, so you have seen fundamental groups of spheres, of various surfaces, of topological groups, of graphs, very, very sketchy, of uh, the, our all favorite non-oriental surfaces, well, I hope at least, the real projective plane, and maybe most people would prefer the Klein bottle. I don't really know why the real projective plane is actually nicer, but maybe the Klein bottle looks nicer. Um, who knows? But anyway, I showed you a few examples of those, and kind of it was always the same argument. So Seifert van Kampen is just very powerful. Um, yeah, anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video, and I also hope to see you next time.